Hi everyone, um, thank you for joining. Uh, just before we start, I uh, just want to <clears throat> highlight a couple of things here. Uh, so just to ensure that you can hear me, if you can just put um, some thumbs up in the chat box, just to confirm that you can hear me. Oh, thanks too. Thanks for confirming. Perfect. Thanks very much. Um, so before we get into it, I uh, just want to quickly um, share this, that if you can just quickly go into your settings and just ensure that you disable all the sounds and notification so you don't get any disturbance as you are trying to watch or listen the, the session. Yes, um, welcome. Uh, today's um, topic is uh, introduction to power distribution. This will be hosted by um, Jack Shiren, who is also our, our lecture here at EIT. Uh, so before I hand over to him, I just want to quickly uh, touch base on some common questions uh, regarding this session. Um, so we will be providing slides and uh, video recording for this session. Uh, so just ensure that you check your emails in the next uh, two business days just after this webinar. So just keep an eye on your emails. We also provide certificates of um, certificate of attendance. So we'll send a digital copy of the certificate of attendance. At the end of this session, I will be sharing a link or a QR code where you need to scan in order to complete a form and get the certificate of attendance. Just know that if you haven't uh, completed uh, the form, unfortunately, we cannot be able to provide you with the uh, certificate. So you need to stick around and ensure that at the end of this session, you complete the, the form as well and in order to get your certificate of attendance. Um, just to, yeah, I'm just going to quickly just introduce myself. Uh, my name is Peri Dikota. I am based in the South African office. Uh, so I usually just look after our market here in Africa. So yeah, for those who are um, joining us for the first time, just a quick rundown about EIT. So, you know, EIT, we an engineering specialist. We specialize in engineering programs. Um, we start with professional certificates. Those are our micro-credential courses. And then we have diplomas, advanced diplomas, undergraduates, uh, graduate certificates, bachelor's, master's, and the highest level of qualification uh, is uh, doctorate. We are um, industry oriented, so we ensure that our resources and uh, materials are up to date to ensure that our student gets a relevant um, education. And yeah, in terms of accreditation, we, we are just like any um, higher education provider in Australia. Our courses are created with our Australian government, and then we also have um, <clears throat> we also have some of our programs that are recognised under three international accords. Um, yes, we are experienced, um, you know, industry experienced. Uh, we have in lectures from different uh, parts of the globe. Uh, we use a unique uh, method in terms of delivering our courses. We've got uh, uh, live interactive webinars uh, that our students use. And then um, we also use uh, interactive, um, you know, simulations and remote labs when coming to uh, practicals. And um, yeah, on that, I will then hand over everything to uh, Mr. Shiran. Good evening, everyone. Hi, Mr. Shiran, are you? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Um, can everybody hear me? Hi, Mr. Shiran. Hi, Barry. Can oh, yeah, you? I can hear you. I can see you actually. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Over to you. 
No worries. Thanks a lot, um, Rita. Really appreciate. Uh, Barry, thanks a lot. Uh, appreciate your introduction um, and a bit about uh, EIT. Um, uh, good evening, you all my engineering muted. friends. Maybe just just quickly double check your your audio. Thanks. Barry, can you hear me? Hello, Barry, can you hear me? Oh, yes. Um, so, I don't know. Um, I cannot yeah, hear you on my well, end, but it I think seems Barry, as if the, everyone can hear you. The rest of the our participants can hear me, so maybe I think you need to just check your connections. Are you um, guys able to hear Mr. Yeah, Shira? Yeah. Um, okay, Barry, okay. so... I think you can just... carry on, and yeah, everyone can hear you. Thanks. Thank you, Barry. Um, I, I think this session is also being recorded, so that's good. Uh, if somebody misses it, they can um, check it up later on. So to all my engineer friends, good evening, senior associates, graduates, and all other participants from around the world. Um, a warm welcome to this online webinar on the power distribution, which is organized by EIT. It is a great privilege to have such a diverse and a global audience joining me today for this webinar on power distribution um, and to understand its key design concepts and some of the modern challenges. I especially want to extend my special thanks to all my EIT colleagues uh, especially Brita and Riley to make it happen and provide me this opportunity to share my industry knowledge with all of you. Um, while I, I was preparing the materials for this presentation, I have tried to resource as much material as I could and details from the different resource days um, with an aim to present the information in such a manner that it is easy to understand um, and accessible to all the participants. Um, you may have some questions which we will discuss towards the end uh, because I will not be able to look at your uh, messages or the comments while I will be speaking. So Barry, if there is anything important, if some, some participants want to discuss, then please let me know. Uh, but otherwise, I will just keep going because we have very limited time to finish uh, most of it. Uh, a quick introduction about myself. Uh, I am originally from India and I completed my master's and bachelor's from uh, Guru Nanak Engineering College in Ludhiana, Punjab, India. So in India for like eight years, I spent, after doing my master's, I spent some time um, with the engineering in the VIT sector, VET sector, which is like going to the rural um, students where they don't have access to higher education and then providing them the skills to become self-sufficient and develop their careers as a trade person. So I, I, I spent like seven years and some of my students are now, they are running their own businesses. So in 2008, we moved to Melbourne, Australia, where I'm, I'm now. And I continue my journey um, as, a, as an engineer, slowly learning Australian way of doing the design engineering. And now at the moment I'm working as team leader in a global consultancy, Arcades, um, and managing uh, a team of highly motivated engineers. Um, and we are, with, with such a short team, we are working on a complex and major projects. Because it is my also second nature to share my industry knowledge with, with, with everybody. So that's why I think this is the best platform to, to discuss about the power distribution with this. Um, so anyway, enough in, in, uh, introduction about myself. So let's get started on the power distribution. So this webinar 
I have planned into three different parts. So the part one will be, we will understand a little bit about power distribution. What is the power distribution? We will also discuss the types of the power distribution. And we will touch base on some of its key concepts. In the part two, we will um, learn a little bit about power distribution design. Why we need the design, overhead design, underground design, and most critical safety in design. It is very hard to cover all the aspects in this short period of time because each one particular task we can run you know a couple of seminars like a couple of days of the training on each one component so it is very hard to cover everything into one hit but i will try my best part three of this presentation will be about the modern challenges which is like the green energy renewable energy and how that is affecting the traditional power distribution and what what are the traditional uh, utilities or the modern utilities are doing to to cope up with that change in the power distribution space right okay so next one this is a very simple model of the power distribution or a power supply model i would say uh, i think i can use the pen as well um, so see here, this is the generating station where the power is being generated in 11 kV or 22 kV or in different voltages. So we have, we, it can be coal or thermal power or hydropower or even nuclear or any other renewable source. Then the power is actually step up, um, step up and then it goes over the transmission lines they, it, the, it will be converted to a very high voltage 220 330 and 500 kV then it runs through miles 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 over the and even sometimes the states over the bigger transmission towers to come to the terminal substation where it will be converted back down into 66 kV to travel within the state and, and some of the urban areas, then within the each urban area, we will have zone substations. In the zone substations, the, the lines will then be converted into 22 kV, 11 kV, or 6 kV in, in some areas in Victoria, still the 6 kV, but now it's 11 kV or 22 kV. So from there, we will have the transformers, again, the step down transformers, which will convert the, the supply to single phase or a three phase as we need for the industrial or the residential purposes. So that is the pretty much a simple power system supply model um, when it comes to the transition of the energy. Types of power distribution. So we can convert the power distribution using different, we can convert into different categories. So the first category of the power distribution classification will be AC versus DC distribution. We all know AC is alternating current, DC is direct current. So the main difference is uh, AC is a, a, a bi-directional current which keep on changing with time. DC is a unidirectional current which is stays constant. So for example, we all have you know studied in the universities ac goes like this sine wave dc goes positive or dc goes negative like that so this is um, the basic functionality we don't want to go into too much details but in a nutshell all our smaller electronic devices they are all into dc uh, because we need a constant power of the sub uh, voltage supply all our house appliances they are all in ac now the one major factor when it comes to the distribution is ac has an advantage because it can be stepped up and stepped down easily and we can transit into a longer distances 
uh, just a second. I think we we are having lots of uh, uh, hand raises, so I request that to leave all the questions towards the end, so that we can con concentrate on the on the presentation. Because otherwise, we will this one hour will go into two hours. Uh, all right. So I request all of you to please um, try not to raise your hands too much. Okay, moving on. Why we need the AC as a preferred way of distribution is, AC is easier to transform between different voltages level, as I said, which makes the high voltage transmission more feasible. And it's more cost effective to, to have the power supplies to our homes from the power generating stations. When it comes to the DC, um, it does not mean that we, we can't have any DC distribution. We, we still have in the few places on, on, uh, in the world, we have HVDC, which is high voltage DC distribution or the transmission. But the, the challenge there is it will require a very, very high um, expensive equipment to, to maintain the HVDC distribution. So both advantages and disadvantages, but um, most favorite type of the distribution is AC. Okay, moving on to a second classification, which is the, the type of the connection. The type of the connection is uh, a radial ring feed and IFT, which we call them interconnected or interfeeder type. Radial systems, pretty simple. I'm going to draw a few lines. We can delete it later. If we have a line and we need to supply this area, there is a substation here, let's say P-type substation. This feed is a radial feed and it stops there. It does not come back to the supply source. When we have a ring feed, it means one HV goes in, we have a substation here, then the second one goes out and it will connect to complete the loop of the system. So like that, it is not like one end like this. Uh, IFT on the other hand is when we have one supply and we can interconnect different uh, substations throughout each other, we will call them as interfeed type and it will have a break here. So something like that. So this is an IFT system in, in a nutshell. Uh, moving on to the construction types, we can have overhead construction, underground construction and hybrid construction. Hybrid means we can have a combination of overhead and underground, both of them together. Now it is underground distribution is becoming more popular because of the aesthetics and less maintenance point of view but still overhead is also preferred from a cost point of view. Now let's move on to another classification based on the distance from the zone substation. So generally, when we, when we have the a zone, zone substation, let's say you have a, sub, uh, a suburb and there is a zone substation just outside of your suburb. In, a, in an uh, urban environment, all the houses are very close to each other and we have high rises building like in the cities. So that means we need more resources, more assets to supply within the small area to supply the various different loads, which is from the residents, from the com commercial loads. So that, that we call it as an urban system. Very congested, very cramped and lots of infrastructure. When it comes to the rural system, so let's say we moved out to the country and then we will have less houses. So less houses means bigger lots, smaller houses, and they may have load requirements. We have to run, the utility companies have to run the, the overhead wires all the way closer to the rural systems, rural substations or the rural customers. And sometimes if, if it's like a, um, a rural city, they will run a three-phase system. If it's only a couple of houses, a group of houses in a rural area, they will only run single phase because it will save them some cost. 
There is another type of the distribution system we call them as sewer system. It's a single wire earth return. So what that means is in a very, very remote area, if we have only one customer, it is not feasible and practically cost effective for the distribution companies to run all the wires um, to supply one customer um, because they will not justify the investment into taking the supply all the way to that customer. What they do is, and there are some limitations to this sewer systems, and it's a little bit risky as well. There is only one wire, one HV wire is running over the top of the poles into a substation, which is a small substation, and the return path of the electricity is via the ground. So that's why it is a little bit risky system because as you go closer to the sewer pole, the, the potential rise is very high and it's a high chances of electrification. So that's, that's a very um, uh, not so preferred system, but it is still in, in service uh, at the moment. Last thing based on the classifications is the types of the distribution systems like overhead distribution, which is the most common underground um, and hybrid. Why it is like a repeated thing, but the difference here is when it comes to the underground distribution, it is like a residential underground distribution to supply all the houses together uh, in, in one setting. We will call them as URD in, 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 in Australia with urban residential development. Okay, now very quickly, um, let's look at the key plants and equipment when it comes to the overhead power distribution. Um, the main equipment or the key plant when it comes to the overhead systems is poles, insulators, conductors, cross arms, pole mounted HP equipment, uh, armor rods, antennas, and other latest developments. Let's have a look briefly um, through each of them. So these are the poles which we use in the utilities. So they are mainly um, based on the different spe specifications, but you can also identify them using the different colors as well. So the first photo on the left-hand side is a, a brown looking wood pole which is which we call them as a creosote treated wood pole so it is creosote and the second one is cca which is um arsenic uh, copper chromium source uh, these we need to treat these poles to to uh, make their life longer and also avoid the uh, attack by the termites when it comes to selection of the poles, on the right-hand side photo, you will see some differences. Uh, it says 12.5 and it's eight BB is written. And then sometimes it's uh, SG is written and this is 12 written. So what that exactly means is 12 and a half is the length of the wood pole. The second number is the kilonewtons, which is the strength of the pole. The bottom two numbers is basically the species of the pole. So BB is Southeast Blackbird, SG is the spotted gum. So that's how they differentiate the, the poles. Another type of the poles, um, concrete is the second most common. Uh, they looks gray in color like a concrete color and the smooth is very finish because we can have the poles in a different strength um, they have a steel steel mesh inside them um, and we can put a heavier load complex structures on on the concrete poles some of the utilities areas are um, one of the messages I received is this number is the utility pole number, just like for the reference, if they want to for their GIS system. That's why every pole has these numbers there. Um, I put the cross axis because um, 
it is a, a poll numbers which is dedicated to each poll okay so Barry just keep uh, keep track of um, of the comments etc which we will explain that at the end of the the slides okay moving on to the concrete continue okay. with the concrete other most common um, use of the concrete poles is the street lighting poles and the photo looks here this is the the base of the day these poles are hollow inside uh, and the steel uh, mesh is uh, inside here another type is the most common is the steel type which is mainly used for extra high voltage 66 kv lines and the other most common use is for the street lighting design. We use the steel poles. Um, nowadays, a fourth type of the poles um, are we are doing, which is in the high bushfire areas. We call them as fiber poles, and we will call composite fiber. They are very light in weight, and they are fire resistant. That's why sometimes in the utilities, we have to use these fiber poles. They are as strong as concrete poles, um, but they are more durable than concrete poles. Let's look at the insulators very quickly. Uh, you have seen most commonly the glass disc insulators, which we have seen on the um, transmission lines. We can use the glass insulators on the 66 kV lines as well. How do we tell if uh, um, this is for 66 and this is for extra high voltage? It is designed that one disk, uh, if, if it meets the particular guidelines, it is suitable for 22 kV insulators or 22 kV voltage level. So if, if you see three glass disk insulators on site, that means it is for 66. Whenever you see one glass disc, that means it's good enough for 22, and we can easily identify uh, from the ground uh, the voltage level. However, it is only a guide. Sometimes you have to refer to the utilities, GIS maps, etc. Other most common type of the insulators are porcelain insulators. So they come into different sizes, different sheds. And uh, the smaller the sheds means the the they, the smaller the voltage levels uh, they are designed for. This is the photo of a 66 kV insulator and you can see the number of sheds are 14, 15 and it can go all the way up to 18 sheds. These are very heavier ones. On this side, this is a 22 kV pin top uh, porcelain insulator. We also have a clamp top, which means these insulators have a clamp on the side where we can actually hold the insulators or sorry hold the conductors why we need to do that because sometimes there is an angle on the overhead line so that means if we use a normal insulator like this the conductor will then pull out from its place because of the angle in the wire so that's why we have to tighten them up using the uh, clamp top Another possible or a new development is the polymer insulators, which are lighter in weight and have the same capabilities um, of the porcelain insulators. So we call them as polymer insulators. For the small LV type, there are some small porcelain insulators. We call them as shackle insulators. This one is used mainly for the stay wires. These ones are mainly used for the side of the pole as a shackle insulators. The most common use of these, these type of insulators are um, the communication um, wires installed on the side of the pole. Okay, moving on. We need to keep an eye on the clock as well. Uh, we need to rush through some of them. Okay, conductors. There are about five different types of conductors we use in the power distribution. The main one is the copper one, and aluminum is the most common. 
copper is used but because of its higher cost and people stealing the copper it is only used for some specific um, situations uh, different types of the copper hard drawn this is mainly for the overhead power distribution soft annealed is mainly for the terminations and the flexibles is for the chaos terminations etc different types you will notice that it has the sheds inside which will differentiate uh, how many strands the uh, a conductor has and whenever you see like a uh, a different color center strand that means it's a steel reinforced on this example which is this one there is no steel enforced it is all aluminium alloy but in this case you will see the steel one the steel conduit so that means it is more stronger but from a conductivity point of view this is better then we have cover conductors as well so generally we have seen the bare conductors running over the wires or the poles but we can also have an insulated cover conductors for the bush fire areas then we go to the steel conductors it is mainly used for the stay wires um, and also when we have to run a long spans of like 400 meters one big span let's say um, across a, a valley um, we use the the steel conductors um, just to save the cost on the poles and the additional infrastructure but they are the bad conductors of the electricity um, so it is not quite often used other popular conductors are the bundle conductors which is hv and lv abc so we can in the high bush fire in a, in a tree areas where there are chances that the conductors will swing and touch the the trees that will trigger the fires etc short circuit so we use the bundle conductor so it is like a one big thick uh, like you will see like a twisted cable which has the different sizes uh, we can have HV as well as for LV. You can see the examples. All right, let's clear these. Cross arms. There is also another important. The more the main types of the cross arms are the steel cross arms and the wood cross arms. You you will see both examples on this photo. The steel one is is mainly for the 22 kV and the 66 kV lines. Um, wood cross arms in in australia we use it mainly for the low voltage lines we still see some of the wood cross arms for the high voltage as well but now with every new development or the new standards they have been shifted towards steel for the high voltage lines a very quick quick summary for um the the types between the steel and the wood uh, cost of the steel is higher, durability is excellent, um, lightning resistance, no, uh, appearance is good, and it is, is widely uh, available. Wood, on the other hand, is the best thing is the durability is, is all right, um, appearance is all right, but they are a little bit cheaper, and, and they are, um, uh, bad conductors of the electricity so that means we we can safely use them for the low voltages um moving on to switch switchgear some of the examples you have seen on the poles is different type of structure and we can go into details of these like for hours but in this presentation today i will only want to give you a brief rundown of what they are so capacitor banks looks like this uh, like this is the capacitor bank this is the air brake switch this is these are the acrs used for the automatical circuit reclosers we will have the other assets on the poles like hb cable heads and even lv cable head poles we will have the transformers on the poles and we can also have the manual gas which is like these ones over there so you will see many different type of the structures which we can attach on for the overhead uh, power distribution 
transformers is is one of the the key or i would say heart of the power distribution we all know its basic functionality but just as a recap this one we we have like a, a single iron core with the windings on it on each limb the amount of the winding determines whether that step up or step down transformer you will see it varies from small type of the transformers all the way to zone substation transformers like the power transformers for our power distribution the most common used are the pole types so this will be like a um, 63 kva and this one will be looks like a 200 kva or 315 kva substation on a platform because of its weight so we use the pole mounted sub transformers in the power distribution in this case when the number of primary turns are lower than the secondary turns so we will have more number of turns on the secondary that means it's a step up transformer on the other side if the numbers of the primary turns are more than the secondary output turns that means it's a step down transformer it's just a nutshell um, we have lots of other um, courses if you want to understand and learn about these we have lots of other courses you can enroll yourself in um, eit you need to get in touch with eit okay other eit you need to get in touch with eit okay other pole top assemblies um we have armor rods vibration damper so what are armor rods they are basically to protect the the cable and regain its its durability strength uh, when we have to connect something we can wrap a second layer of the armor rods it will increase the lifespan of the uh, conductors and there are many examples on youtube if you want to go into the details of armor rods why why they are being used mainly for the durability um, so that no erosions will be there that's why we use them um, and, and secondly, for the stays, etc. This is the second thing which we do with the stays, antennas, and, and the other assets. Uh, you can see some of the antennas, etc. Vibration dampers. Vibration dampers are basically uh, used to avoid the vibrations when there are long spans of the uh, lines, such as transmission lines. So it will it will absorb the vibration and then it will uh, save the the line and the insulators from um... next one is stays we will go into a little bit of more details about the stays etc inline stay and um, bisect stay sidewalk and a footpath stay so this particular example this is the termination pole we we have to put a stay at the back of this so that means it is a, an inline stay. Similarly, this is also an inline stay. Bisect stay is when we have a line like that and we have to bisect the line, we will call it as a bisect stay, which will protect the, the line. And because all the forces will be pulling into this side, that's why it will, um, we will call it as a bisect. There is another type of the stay. If we don't have the room to install the full stay, we call them as a sidewalk or a footpath stay. Uh, so these are some of the basic type of the stays. Uh, moving on to angles, the stay angles, they can be 45 degrees, 60 degrees. Um, and this one, is, uh, we call them as the aerial stay. So we have a road here we there is no way that we can put a stay in the middle of the road so what we have to do is we have to install a pole on the other side run it overhead and then goes into the ground so we call them as an aerial stay okay uh, let's clear this moving on There is another new development happening, which is the pole mounted uh, battery storage systems. Um, these battery storage systems, we can now, uh, it's a community battery storage, which we can install it on the poles as, as well. 
So these are some of the latest developments or the key plant and the equipment when it comes to the overhead distribution. Underground distribution, same thing. Um, we need to look at these key plant and equipment, extra high voltage, low voltage cables, LV service cables, insulations, conduits, cable joints, cabinets, substations, etc. So like these are some of the, um, the you can see the how they looks like the HV and LV power cable. So HV is a single core and uh, a three core uh, cable. When we have to use the cables for extra high voltage, like 66 kV application, we have to run three single cores in along each other. But for distribution like 22 kV, we can use a combined one cable with three cores inside. Similarly for LV cables, most commonly used in Australia is 240. And in other countries, it will be similar size for the distribution of the, of the power. And we will have a T of, of the cables like these smaller cables connected to this big cable to supply the homes. The cable components very easily. Um, we all know that a conductor, this is the screen XLP insulation, insulation screen, semiconducting tape, uh, corrugated. This is the sheets to protect the cable and the external outer PVC. The type of the conduits in the power distribution can be three different types, metallic, uh, electrical PVC, and the corrugated types. So the metallic conduits um, we mainly use for the outer mechanical protection. Let's say if we have a shallower cables, we can put metallic conduits uh, and sleeve the electrical conduits underneath them. And, and sometimes, um, especially if it's attached next to the wall, we have to protect it so that no, nobody can break the conduit to expose the cable. So we can use it on the wall there, et cetera, as well. Most widely used PVC conduit, which is heavy duty, medium and light duty. Sometimes for the flexibility, we need to use corrugated conduits and it will have conduit bands like 90, 45 and 22 and a half. Connect them. Uh, other types of the key plant and equipment is the joints. So you will see here, there is a joint bay uh, where the connectors are done. And then once they fill, we've done the connections, they will then fill it with the resin. This is mainly for the low voltages cable or the HP cable. If it's an extra HP cable, 66 kV connections, then we have to do a pre-cast joint bay. Um, and these are the cables going inside the joint bay. So this is for the extra high voltage types of the joints. Other equipments, other things to keep in mind for the distribution is the termini cable terminations and the high voltage cable joints. These are, this is how the terminations looks like. Um, other underground equipments, it can be cabinets, pillars, pits, substations. They look like this. This is the internals of the kiosk type substation, HV and LV. And we can also have square pits as well. These are the pillars. They can be customer pillars as well as utility pillar. So these are some of the things which we normally do for the power uh, key, key plant and equipment for the distribution. Okay, now we need to rush through some of them. We are near the time. Part two is the power distribution design. So why we need the design? So we need, we need the design to keep in mind a couple of the factors efficiency, safety, voltage regulation, environmental impact, capacity planning, financial benefits to the distribution company. So all of these factors will trigger the need of a power distribution design. And with all the new green energy coming into the field, that becomes even more important that what is that we do a proper power distribution design. Um, what are the key things we, we need to keep in mind when we do the power distribution is the load, how much load is required, what is the voltage level we need to design, circuit design, what is the protection and switch gear required, earthing and bonding, environmental conditions, utility and regulatory compliance, 
uh, and the cost consideration, of course. Overhead power distribution brief overview. The various stages will be first thing is we need to find the route selection, how the route will go. We need to survey the land and the overhead line route, detailed design. Then we have to do the costings. Then we have to do the drawings, construction audits, and then ultimately the anodization. The design steps will include select the structure type, conductor, conductors, stringing charts, pole types, cross arms, insulators, and all of that, including the load details. When you want to learn the design in detail, that means it will be, um, uh, it's like a complete a course for six months to understand the each and every type, but I try to sort it out in, uh, in a quicker, um, simplified version. Span length is when we have the two pole and the length, the horizontal length, uh, uh, distance between the two poles is called span length. Sag is when the conductor sags because of the weight, the distance, this is this distance we call them as a sag. Um, average conductor's height minus the ground clearances. That this area we call them as a sag. Line deviation is when we have an original line and the line tees off, this angle created is a deviation angle. And we will call them into D minus if it's less than 180 and D plus if it's more than 180. Uh, MES is the ruling span. If we have number of the poles uh, in line, then it is the average of the span lens all sum of span length divided by the, its cube, cube of each span length, their, their sum divided by sum of all the spans into a square root. That will give us the MES. So MES is important to find out the exact stringing from the stringing charts. Now, what is an uplift? Uplift is also very important to keep in mind in the design side. Um, because let's say in this scenario, if we have done this, it will actually pull the conductor out. Um, this conductor will pull it from this insulator. So that's why we have to design accordingly to keep this in mind. Right. Um, so, okay, let's clear this and move on to the next one. Okay. Very quickly, cross arms, we will have pole top and extreme offset cross arms. They will look like this. Um, then we have intermediate, which has like a straight lines. We have angle type, which you can see there is an angle happening on the side. This is a clamp top. You can go through the slides later with the details. I try to put as much detail. And then we have a subsidiary structures, which is like on the side here. Um, so these are all the different types. Continuing on, we also have a few more types of the structures. This one is a strain structure where the, 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 the conduits actually ends and then there will be another insulator and the bridges are over this. So we use the strain type because if there is a change in the conductor, if there is a change in the conductor tension and change in the switching. Then we also have a terminal structures. So when the conductor stop at a pole and it does not go through, we call them as a termination. We also have an anchor, which goes like that. So we will have an anchor like this. So a couple of other I put in through is LVABC, which is the bundle. This is how it looks like. The strain looks like this. Then we also have a bare conductor interface with the LVABC and the bare wires. <clears throat> Underground power distribution, very quickly, same thing. Why we choose? It says static purposes. Um, we can use the undergrounding of the overhead lines, new UID states, new industrial commercial. And these are some of the steps we have to go through um, when we design the underground. 
sorry, I need to go through a little bit faster because we will be running out of time. Um, but if you have any questions, you feel free to reach out to me anytime. Voltage selection, we, we need to select 22 kV LB cables, insulation type, earthing and bonding, termination and joints, and we have to keep in mind the current rating as well. Now, this is one example of a master plan if it, in a URD state. So you can see here, the one HP feed is coming. These are the small substations um, which are placed throughout this whole development. And then a one HP feed comes in we will decide how that is going to go throughout the whole estate and then um, like that. So once we've done this master planning, then we go into the detailed design stage. We also do how we will supply each and every customer. Similarly, this one example is, um, this one example is for a, uh, a URD plan, which is a residential development. You can see here, uh, there is a substation and the cables are installed like this um, with supply to each and these are the lights here. This is one particular example, like this is how the detailed design looks like. Um, okay, moving on. Last part, uh, sorry, another thing is the safety in design. The safety in design, we have to follow the regulatory references. We have to keep in mind the safe approach distances. And we do have few no-go zone rules where you are not allowed to go certain distance to the overhead power lines. And whenever we are designing the line, we have to keep in mind the sing and, uh, sag and sway of the conductors, which is like how far from the vegetation or from the buildings we have to keep in mind. Uh, we have to follow the utility guidelines when it comes to the clearances, like for example, 66 to LB, we need minimum 1.5 meters. And similarly, going onwards, we have to follow the local utility standards and regulatory. They are different in each con um, country. So you follow your own local standards. For the building, building, we also have to keep in mind if a building is closer, how much the conductor swings to the line, we need to maintain certain clearances so that a person can't reach to the swinging conductor. For the underground design, the key importance is um, we have to follow the guidelines uh, when it comes to the clearance to the other assets. We don't have to dig too deep trenches um, just to keep and follow the utility guidelines. Similarly, we have to keep the standard regulations when it comes to the distance between the conduits, whether this is a HP conduit, and also distance to the other utilities. Every utility will have some guidelines on maintaining the safe requirements, safe distances. That's what we have to follow. Very quickly, the modern challenges to the legacy department is um, distribution model is now with the influx of the solar and the green energy, everybody is generating their own electricity. Because they are generating their own electricity, people are not uh, reliant on the, the traditional connection from the utilities as they used to be. So that means it is um, a, a challenging situation for the utilities. So they need to now change their focus towards the green energy so that they, they will join the race. Um, before uh, it was um, the traditional network is from the generating station, the energy comes to us. Now with this distribution model, we are also generating the electricity and giving it back to the grid. So that is the, the next challenge now. Um, EV charging station, they are also another challenge to the power distribution companies because they need a constant, um, a bigger supply from a different times of the, of the day. Whenever somebody charges it, the graph below shows how much they charge and whenever somebody plugs in their uh, their car into into them. 
So that's why all of these are giving a big challenge to the utility companies. And that's it from my end. Uh, Barry, uh, thank you so much for listening in. At the end, we need to rush through some of the slides because of the time. Um, but yeah, I tried my best, but if you have any questions, please uh, come back to me. And thank you so much for listening and joining in. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, just checking if uh, maybe there's any um, inputs. Oh, okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, just to take you through some, if you want to view our upcoming uh, programs, uh, course schedule. So you can go on our website and go under course schedule, then you will see um, our upcoming programs. And yeah just to highlight some of our upcoming webinars so if you can just ensure that you go on the website and go to register if you would like to attend the webinars yeah and then uh, for those who have uh, been asking and us as i've also mentioned in the beginning that i'll be sharing the slides so yeah you can just scan the QR code to ensure that you request your certificates of attendance. Uh, just ensure that you've got, just to make sure that um, you get your certificate, you've got until Sunday the 24th of September to request your certificate of attendance. If you don't complete um, uh, the form in time, unfortunately, we're not gonna be able to assist you with that. So you've got until Sunday the 24th to complete the form. I will just also quickly um, post the link for those who are not able to scan the QR code. And then if you can just follow the link to complete the, the certificate of attendance. And everybody, it's uh, not possible to answer all your questions, um, but if you can reach out to Barry or myself, and I will try to explain them um, via my email, uh, which is uh, jackdeep.suran at eit.ed. Um, or because uh, it is only from time to time, otherwise you can reach out to Barry as well. Thanks. I will also just share an email address that you can use in order to uh, share your input or any feedback. So I just post that. Uh, one, a link to request your certificate. And then, um, yeah, the email address you can just use to share any of your experiences or any feedback you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Um, enjoy the rest of the day and, and night. It depends various different regions, but I enjoy it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Yaktip. Have a great one. Thank you, Barry. Really appreciate your support. Such a pleasure.